Michael, I've been reading the book Trillions by Robin Wigglesworth of late from the FT, and one of the interesting stories in there is how Jack Bogle founded Vanguard back in the day. And he talked about this idea that, like, how structure guides your strategy. And I have to feel, do you think Vanguard was the first DAO? Was Vanguard the first DAO? No. It was the, it was the, the Dow Jones. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so the whole, the whole concept of the Dow blows my mind, but I actually think asset management is a perfect place for it. So last week we had Index Coop on our Talk Your Book segment for the podcast. They are, what does Dow stand for again? Decentralized Autonomous Octobot. No, organization. Organization. So we talked about Index Coop or the Index Cooperative, and they have this suite of DeFi products in crypto. So they have the DeFi Pulse Index. They have the Metaverse Index. They, they have all these different – they have the Bankless BED Index. I don't know what's in that one. Um, that's, that's Bitcoin, Ethereum, and DeFi. Okay. So they have all these different products, and – it's not an asset management firm, right? And they have a, and they have a token, a governance yes, token. And they have their you... own governance token. So instead of owning the stock of a of BlackRock or something, it's a governance token that you can own in this. By the way, full, full disclosure, we're both long. Yes, but this whole concept, to me, this makes sense for this space where you have people voting on the structure of this cooperative and where what's going to. And this place has five hundred million. I just checked the actually. You, you sent me a slide. You sent me a slide that you just you just v- had your first DAO vote. I voted. I, I own index tokens, and I voted. They have more than five hundred seven million dollars in assets. This is this is mind blowing to me that this happens, and and I think as DeFi and, and all this this crypto stuff gets easier for on ramps and making it easier for people to invest, this this stuff is going to be even bigger. It's crazy to think that the it's next coming around, folks. Well, the the next huge asset manager could be owned by its constituents, the people. Right. It's very so. So, so back to your point. Would 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 Jack Bogle have started a DAO? He basically did. Maybe he kind of because did. Vanguard it's owned by its shareholders. Anyway, check out our Talk Your Book segment from last Monday, and go to indexcoop.com to learn more about their products. Hang on, yeah, go there. But this is interesting, Ben. Would would imagine that Vanguard was like literally the shares were owned by the shareholders? I know the like the profits and yes, it's. It, I, I think it's possible. Anyway, indexcoop.com. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. This was the week where the wheels really fell off of, I guess, call it the the ARK industrial complex, all of the high beta negative tech earners that were all the rage in 2020. And it's not, it's not, it's not just this week, right? These things have been getting smashed for a long time, but this was the week where it seemed like everybody paid attention to it. Uh, ARK fell to a 52 week low. I mean, there's blood in the metaverse. The Popular growth stocks peaked in February, I guess, or March. It's been a while. Okay. And they, what are you, JC Peretz? I, oh, no, I'm just saying, like a lot of these <laughs> these companies, they spiked in January and February, and now they've come in and they've had a couple different crashes, and they just keep crashing. Well, I guess what's what's new is that now, like they're all crashing. So it was Zoom and Peloton and Zillow, but now it's even getting to the Shopify's and Squares of the world. So Jim Bianco, which we're going to lean on him for a few charts this week, put out some great stuff showing Bianco, the S&P. nice charts, right? They're Be- char- beautiful charts. Good looking charts here. Beautiful charts showing the S&P 500 equal weight. And, uh, you know, it's down, what is it down? Four or 5% maybe uh, versus the Morgan Stanley most expensive index. I can't see what this says, but just, just absolutely slaughtered. Just look at the two lines. It's a crocodile mouth, right? I guess- that's the thing is, we talked about this a little bit last week, how market cap can really hide a lot of this stuff. But even the equal weight index is doing fine. It's just literally this one segment of the market that everyone just loved. It's So Morgan Stanley has this other beautiful chart showing a basket of crowded stocks. They recorded their worst performance on record ever versus the S&P 500 on Friday. So it's not just like everybody pays, oh, everybody's finally noticing. No, no, no. The wheels, li- they were they were buckling. They were they were getting killed, but the wheels really fell off on Friday. Bloomberg, and this, I guess, came from Peter Atwater, who was in this Bloomberg piece. They, they, they're they onto this. They're calling it a Quentin Tarantino market because they say everything's fine in the front room, but then downstairs, 
Someone's got the the ball in their mouth and the leather stuff on, and someone's getting killed potentially. <laughs> Step aside, Butch. <laughs> yeah. So all all these yeah all these stocks are getting we we've talked about a, a lot of them, but they said they looked at the most crowded names by I guess Morgan Stanley has this index of the top fifty most crowded stocks based on thirteen F filings by hedge funds, and then they said the that crowded basket and an excess basis was down like eleven percent versus everything else, which is its worst brutal, which is its worst relative performance since even March 2020, saying that this stuff is just getting wrecked. I mean, a lot of this people focus on the retail, but this is hedge funds. This is actual, this isn't. Well, just- that's what I was going to say. Like, so, so one last data point, and then we'll get into some, some editorial, as they say. Liz Ann Saunders said the basket of the most shorted tech stocks, which is ironically also the most crowded trades, right? On the long side is down 48% worse drawdown uh, which is worse than the drawdown earlier this year and 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 worse than the bear market of 2020. Wait, so these so, bears are actually finally having a little bit of finally. Wow. You know what? Good for them. It's yes. been a minute. It's it's been a minute. Uh I something got, finally ended badly and they were right. I got a ton of people texting me on Friday and by ton I mean three. But still, three is about a hundred percent more than I normally get. Uh it's bringing up the average. Of, of people screenshotting me their their Alibaba, their portfolio. Literally, what do I do? And I'm like, what are you, what are you asking me for? I was the one. I, was, I, I, I sold Zillow. I sold Peloton. Don't ask me. Uh, so, but it's very interesting that all of the professional investors, not all, but a lot of older professional investors who are wagging their finger at ARK and Kathy Wood and the Wall Street Bets crowd, it's very interesting that it's, it's the hedge funds that are also piling to this. But okay, so now what? So now the wheels came off. They got their comeuppance. You could wag your finger in their face if you want. What do you win? Well, they win a market that's only down three and a half percent. Like I, that's that's the crazy thing to me is that I think a lot of people said once this speculative excess is taken out of the market, watch out below because the market's going to get creamed. Right, and here we are. And that so the market itself is down three and a half percent from all time highs. It's doing just fine. So here's the thing: everyone has wanted to believe this is. 1990s 2.0 for a long time now. And when the excess leaves like it did in two, early 2000, watch out below and the whole market's going to crash. Is it possible we could see all this excess stuff, the speculative euphoria, all that stuff, get creamed and the market just kind of shrug and say, all right, well, we did. have at it. We did. We did. Because we saw, we saw a big growth sell-off in May and the market shrugged it off and went on to new highs. So it's, not, it's possible that this bleeds over into the broader market. Hasn't yet. Here's another interesting chart from uh, Liz Ann Saunders. With volatility has come swift correction and frothy behavior. And sentiment trader, by the way, where has he been? That, yeah. In, my, in our lives. I, I feel like I haven't referenced. Packy McCormick boxed him out for a while for your, uh, you have attention Hang span on a for second. one. You only have one crush. Honestly, did he, blo- the podcast. did he block me? <laughs> I still follow him. Okay. Okay, he did not block. <laughs> the other reason I'm asking is because I haven't mentioned him in a long time. I feel like I haven't seen him tweeted in a while. I think it's just because you're you have you have crypto blinders on right now. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, you just like so woke anyway, up from a blackout and you're like, whoa, Sentiment <laughs> Trader still here. <laughs> He's still doing his thing. Um, all right, so so they tweeted so the dumb money confidence, which is smaller odd lot traders like the people that were emailing me on uh, texting me on Friday. By the way, one of the people who texted me on Friday. Bought Ark. I, I don't know if I said this on the podcast because this is not in good taste, but I definitely told you this, Ben, that he bought Ark in December and said to me, I literally don't think she could lose money. <laughs> yes. you, I think you sent it to me that day and you're like, okay, okay. this thing is toppy. That, that's it. <laughs> I mean, okay. Um, Which funny though, I, I, I saw him like uh, two or three months later. It was actually, it was, in, it, was, it was in the spring when Ark was in its initial drawdown and he said, uh, I'm shorting Ark. <laughs> okay. <laughs> By the way, so that, anyway, that, that uh, was really bad taste for the short ARC fund, but they nailed the timing on nailed that. Nailed it. Right? Yeah, SR. <laughs> SR. Good ticker. That's uh, perfect. Okay. Um, so, so dumb money confidence has dropped while smart money, which is large commercial hedgers, has grown most confidence since March 2020. So this is an interesting juxtaposition where smart money, whatever, you know, take that for what it's worth, is getting more confident where dumb money, again, I, I don't like that term, but uh, is blowing out. Which is funny because the dumb money was really smart last year, right? They they looked smart and, and felt smart probably. And so so there, there there was an article in Vice about uh, I lost everything on Alibaba call options. Oh, this was a tough read. What I, was interesting was that GameStop was a tipping point for this person. So they said that they were like dabbling crypto stocks, whatever, but they really like went all in 
on, on uh, when GameStop had that moment. That's when this person got laser eyes for stocks. But they had they had like three hundred grand in a s- online savings account, and then they went from that to buying options. Right. A- and it was one single contract. This is this is I've used this analogy before. This is your high school friend who never drank in high school and wagged their finger at you, and then they go to college, and the first weekend they're throwing up in their bed, and they have like three you know, Zemos or something, and they can't handle themselves and they're hung over for the rest of the semester. That's basically this. So to me, this, this is a, this is a good takeaway. And by the way, kudos to this person for writing. So honestly, they have a good head on their shoulders. They understand that there are bigger tragedies in life and they seem to be okay. Even though my God, this has to hurt very, oh. very, very badly. But anyway, I don't, know how you this, come, I don't know how you come back from this. Honestly, it's tough. It's tough. Mentally, this to me, this, oh. this to me is the lesson. Ben, we had a person email us. What do I do about Alibaba? This was like three weeks ago. Right. And so the problem is if you don't have some sort of risk management going into these high growth stocks, you have to have an exit or no exit where you're going to position yourself such that you can live through the inevitable 50, 60% drawdowns because they are inevitable. And potentially put more money in, right? Right. Like you have to have some sort of game plan. Because one or the other. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just paralyzed. It consumes you. So this person said, I sold and shut down my Robinhood account in October, right before my birthday. I decided I don't want to have this hanging over my hanging over my head. The day I sold it, I was like, you know what? I fucked up. It was a mistake. But clean slate, dust yourself off and move on. I felt better when I sold, much better actually. And that is probably always the right answer. I think what people are afraid of is that I just rolled this thing down 40%. I can't sell now because now I'm gonna I'm gonna make matters worse. I'm gonna sell at the bottom. Guess what? You're probably not selling. Here's, the, at the here's bottom. what I thought was the worst part about this. And first of all, this person they kind of blamed Robinhood, but also took a lot of personal. They said, "Listen, this is my fault. No one else's." They kind of said Robinhood didn't help, but I, but I think this is this is this kind of thing happens with or without Robinhood. But they said, "When I lost the money, the things that I the thing that I regretted the most were not actually losing the money. I realized I just know their passions at all. For three years now, all I've done is work. I can't think of one weekend when I was just having fun. How stupid is that? So not only did they lose money, but all the money that they piled up from working so much, they stockpiled. They then blew that. So you're you're also not only wasting money, you're wasting time." Because all that so, effort at work is just gone. Let me ask you. Oh, your boy Ryan Reynolds is on uh, on CNBC. What's he talking about? He's an entrepreneur. He has a gin company. He's got a production company. He's the uh, man. By the way, man, someone, he is a handsome man. Someone came. We'll talk about Christmas movies at the end for recommendations. But someone, someone really gave me some crap about Just Friends. I'm sorry if you don't think Just Friends is is funny, then we can't be friends. I agree. I, uh, speaking of handsome, I was watching. I've never seen JFK. I started. It's like a three and a half hour mo- movie. I started watching JFK this weekend. Young Kevin Cons- young Kevin Costner. What a stud muffin. He had a fastball, right? Holy cow, like I was handsome. He still is as John Dutton, but my God, was he a handsome man. Okay, where are we going? Oh, Ben, can we say that now that all of these young traders have experienced a blow up bear market, are they good to go? I am now, I am really sick now, of that, saying like you've never- now ex- can we, Yes. Yeah, now can we stop making fun of them? Okay, they experienced a bear market. Now, now are they pros? Now are they geniuses? Now can we stop dunking on them? Right. This I agree, and and now this is the, this is a crazy. I want to talk about this a little bit more when I come to New York to visit you in a couple of days. Can't wait to see you. But I'm I'm excited too. But I feel like every trader investor with any experience now has like four or five different paths they could take. We have the '70s here. Well, this is the '70s, and now we have no, no, no. This is actually the '90s where we're going to have another good decade like we just had in the '80s, and then someone else goes, no, no, no. This is actually 2000. This sounds like a blog post that you're half ba- that's uh, in the oven. I'm just 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 start considering that we're like we every historical analogy right now that path is there for anyone to take if they want it. Just let that one simmer a little bit. Think about it for Thursday, okay? Okay. Uh, my knee jerk reaction is 1860s, but all right. Well, uh, all right. We'll put a bit in that. Um. So, DocuSign. Holy shit! <laughs> you ever see this before? <laughs> was it was it down 40 percent in one day? What so so now so this segment is called bad quarter guys. What happened? I, I admittedly I did not I did not even get to the earnings report. What happened? Is 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 the fax machine making a comeback? Maybe the fact that we complained so much on our on your interview with Max from Doma about the fact that you can't use DocuSign with refinancing yet. They need to get into refis. That's the problem. By the way, so people may have missed it Saturday. We released it. We had an extra. That was awesome. Yes. What a what a what a chat that was. Yeah, immediate man crush we had on Max. He was a great guy. We got along very well, right? When during the recording, I said to Ben, "All right, when we're done recording, we totally got to ask this guy if we could invest." And then I put I 
I typed in Doma Crunchbase. I said, oh shit, they're public. <laughs> yeah, public company. So we can invest. <laughs> we can invest. Yeah. But this is, DocuSign is a company that was already getting slaughtered and then it fell 40% in, in a day. So see, here, here's, here's a lesson. Like for, for people that were asking me, two people were asking me about Alibaba. And this is again, a while ago. It can't go any lower. Oh yeah? When, like never say that. Well, here's the thing. Because, because Every- as much as you think stocks are, uh, overshot to the upside. Yes, they can always go further in one direction or the other. Than it's, a, you think. it's a pendulum. Yes, that's the thing. In 2020, and in early 20, that January and February, when things went absolutely bonkers and the GameStop stuff took off, there were so many stocks that went w- way far this side, and they just and everyone kind of said, "How can this thing be trading at 30 times sales or whatever it is?" And at the time, a lot of people were like, "Well, it can't," or the market just doesn't care anymore. Like valuations don't matter, whatever. And now it's going to go the other way and. Peloton went from 24 times sales to three. 24 to three. The crazy thing is we're going to have some survivorship bias in five to seven years where 20% of these companies are going to look like amazing purchases. But then the other 80% are probably just going to kind of tread water or not really come close to getting back to those peaks. I'm going to go higher than than 20. Okay, you think more than that? And by the way, although when you are saying to yourself, this this can't possibly go any lower... That's probably close to here, a bottom. Well, here's the other. Here's the other. Do you th- do you think yes or no? But here, yes. But here's the other thing in the back of your mind: the fact that the market is only down three and a half percent, and these things are down 40, 50, 60 percent. Don't you go in the back of your mind like, well, what if the market falls down another leg and the market goes down fifteen percent? These things aren't. Just gonna, yeah. They're not going to rise. They're going to fall more, right? Like you have to unless, have that in the back unless, of your head. unless it's uh, first out, uh, first out, first in. I guess that would be my who, thinking though. That like, who knows? when the market falls, most other stocks fall as well. So everything is getting slaughtered, except for treasury bonds. Uh, we'll talk about crypto in a second, but uh, what was that stat you sent me about Top Shot? Oh, they, someone gave just the, the. Hang on, let me find out. I got it. In Whatever. Here. Okay. It's 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 everything. And and good news, commodities. So he, okay, so commodities are falling. So I have the Bloomberg Commodities Index down ten percent. Oil prices are down like fifteen to twenty percent. Do you put any credence into the fact that we can use this as a signal that inflation may be topped? That that when commodity prices are falling, that's a sign that inflation is falling as well. Or do you think that that's not? I, I no bet you. I bet. There? I bet you. There's no good data there. But in this case, I'm gonna just hope that the answer is yes. By the way, here's another bet we should make on Calshay. Will the Bloomberg Commodity Index be up or down in six months? Okay, there you go. I say down. You know why I, I say down? I would almost say down as well. Because I'm a patriot, Ben. You know this. Okay. Documented patriot. I say down. I, th- I think this was probably four or five weeks ago. You put in a story here about get ready for higher gas bills this winter because it's coming natural gas prices. Well, <laughs> natural gas futures posted, this is from Bloomberg, posted their biggest November loss in 20 years with prices down 30% from recent highs. These things are getting, this stuff is getting crushed. And they're saying they're blaming it on there's warmer weather than people thought. And so maybe gas bills aren't going to be all time highs for people. What about gasoline? Like car gasoline. I feel like that's coming in too. I think I saw a chart about that. Yeah. So I think gas prices across the country are now mostly going under three, three dollars a barrel. So you're gonna have to take, you're gonna have to go take all your stickers off. Uh, Or can it still say I did that? (laughs) And more good news. And maybe it's a little premature to dunk, but, but listen, we'll take it on the supply chain side, on the supply chain side, bottlenecks appear to be easing. So says this chart from Morning Joe. The number of container ships waiting outside Los Angeles, Long Beach, fell considerably in November. I think the Flexport, guy, I think the Flexport guy tried to debunk it a little on Twitter, but it does seem like it's getting better, right? Uh, well, all right. Be that as it may, Connor Sen tweeted, getting close to a five-month low for ocean freight rates between Shanghai and Los Angeles. Okay. Did you read the, the CNBC piece on USA, Amazon? USA. USA. I, I think we're getting there. Did you read the piece on... Amazon and then CNBC basically uh, saying not. Amazon has beat because last week I said, Hey, how come I'm getting all my stuff from Amazon? It's, it's coming on time. That's a good, we've thing. been, we've been, we've been, we've been saying that. How come Amazon, there's no delays. Okay. So they, they said that like for years, Amazon has been, has been chartering their own private cargo ships. They make their own containers. And instead of going into the LA port, they go to this port in Washington and, tr- and truck stuff down to LA if they need to. And they've like, they've already gotten ahead of this. I think we're, I mean, of course, Bezos was ahead of this. Are we past the point of him being like one of the best business minds of his generation, and probably the, one of the best business minds of all time? What do you mean past? He's not the CEO. He's not the CEO anymore, as you know. But what do you mean past? Well, I'm saying if like historic, historic, instead of just like this current 
cycle of business people. Like he's on the Mount Rushmore. Oh like, yeah, yeah. He he figures everything out before it has to be figured out. Just I mean, read the story and, you, and you're like, oh, okay, Amazon kind of already figured this out before everyone else. Yes. And everyone else is going to have to fall in line probably. And some of these other big companies are going to are scrambling to do this now. And Bezos already figured it out before everyone else. So before we get into the crypto news that we made last week, uh, Robin, my wife, went to Austin, Texas for the weekend. And Austin, Texas is, is a crypto hub. And they red pilled her. She, she texted me. This was on Saturday. Can I get Coinbase? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, LOL, what? And then she said, to do crypto. <laughs> and then I said, oh my gosh. So she came home and I was like, what were you asking me about crypto? Uh, because you know, like we're, we're invested and like we made this index, like we're kind of there, you know? And she's like, well, they were just talking about like all the stuff, like the third web and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, web three. She's like, yeah, that like, can we like, can we do some of that? Oh, gee. For the record, I have, tr- cause I know people Did are she like, hear, like people talking at the bars about this stuff. No, it was her, it was her friend's husband. I have tried. I want to let the record show repeatedly to include my wife in the finances, and I've got rejected at every turn. It's, yeah, I, we're we're in a similar boat here. Yeah, it's not like I haven't tried to tell her about our, whatever. Our talks now are basically just, are we okay? Yes. Okay. Good. That's yeah. all I want to know. Right. So, right. so yeah, I'm not going to say like Robin, like what do you like? What do you think is ETH going to flip Bitcoin? <laughs> right. Uh, so you're not sharing like your MetaMask. Like, like what happens if if you die? Are you going to like? Is it going to be like Memento where you're going to have to have it tattooed on yourself somewhere? Your 12 thing for your MetaMask wallet, like your 12 uh, code words or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> like on your inner thigh. <laughs> Follow this to get your... <laughs> All right. Uh, a new movie for Web3 era. All right. So we've been, we talked a couple weeks ago. I said, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to go as deep down the rabbit hole as you. I need to just invest in this stuff passively and obviously I, well, I, I made a solution for you yeah, yeah you're welcome yes I, I think so but here's what so last week you announced this this was, we got a bunch of publicity on this which was nice and you guys had jeremy schwartz so if people want to listen to the the compounded friends with you and jeremy schwartz and josh you get more on the details what did we announce that we have a new crypto index that we created with wisdom rwm tree, rwm crypt, wisdom tree wisdom tree crypto index yes and we worked with on ramp and wisdom tree and gemini and all gemini. these different companies it's interesting though, like even with passive investing and making this an index, I, I was saying this to you last week, there's still a lot of decisions you have to make. And, and I think even more so in this space than you have to do in stocks, right? This was, we were batting around ideas in this for months and months and, and kind of had an idea and then Wisdom Tree kind of shaped it. Like it was, it's not easy to come up with an index in this space because of the way that this whole entire space is constructed, right? Because you have stable coin. If you just said, I'm going to take the top 10, you have stable coins, and you have Ripple, which is, gee, I don't know, whatever that is. You have all these things. So there's still decisions to Doge. be made here, right? Yes. You got Doge? Yes, you have meme coins and all this stuff. So uh, anyway, and also some of the other tokens that we're invested in, in like the DeFi and Metaverse space, trying to explain this stuff in plain English, it's not easy, right? So we have descriptions of these, but you and I both just, said just, like- it's, it's the third web. That's all you need to know. But, but you and I said, look, let's go through and try to explain this stuff ourselves and, and each of these tokens- Try to do it in plain. It's not. Some of them are not easy. You did a do. commendable job. You did a commendable job. We're, we tried. Um, I read also, one. Do, uh, do, you, do you want to read one? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. Okay, I'll, I'll find one for later. Uh, here's another thought I had on this whole thing. This to me was a pandemic project where I think a post-pandemic work world actually made it easier to put something like this together. So I want to first of all kudos to you. I don't know if I, so you were like the general contractor on this project. <laughs> because there's all right, there's all these like if you're building a house, you need a general contractor to do like the person to do the trim and the paint and the well, framing. Can I run with can I can I run with an analogy for a second? Let's do it. As we as we were building this house, I was freaking out because my materials were going up so much in price. <laughs> yes. Right? We we started we started this we started talking about this. I looked at I looked at the Slack timestamp this. We started talking about this uh, when Bitcoin was like forty one thousand dollars, and one of the biggest fears I had in the back of my mind was we are racing against an ETF. Yes, and, and when. The, when the futures ETF was law, was announced, the price almost rose to six seventy thousand dollars, and I was like, "My materials, my yes. materials!" I was freaking out. Uh, yes, our biggest nightmare was we're going to roll this out at seventy Bitcoin seventy five k, and we do not want to have our clients invest in this stuff when it's at a huge all time high. And so the fact that it's come in a little bit was well, like this is, this, a sigh of relief for us. This is, a, I mean, I view this as a blessing because buying into a panic, a buying panic, 
would have been awful. Would have been just awful. Now, while it's not fun to see that you launch an index and uh, the, the next day prices crash 20%, in our seat, like I'm invested, I don't care, but for our clients, right. I'm thrilled that they get to invest at lower prices. Right. Yeah, it's good. We were like the guinea pigs on this. We invested and we're so we're taking part in the losses, but but yeah, the but the pandemic stuff. So we're working with on ramp to have the technology side in this and wisdom tree is helping on the investment side and the Gemini is the custodian. I feel like if this was five years ago, someone would have said, All right, that's enough. There's too many parties here. Yeah. We're all meeting in New York. Before we get yes. to we're having everyone there, but instead there were calls where we had four, five, eight people from different organizations on and people could kind of work as they were talking and on Zoom. Like, So I feel like the work from home pandemic stuff actually made it easier to pull off a project like this in a pretty fairly quick amount of, you know, relatively quick amount of time. I had to consider that, but you're 100% right. So, all right, let's get into briefly some of the price action that we saw over the weekend. So I woke up on Saturday morning, checked my, my uh, Masari app, and I see the entire complex down 17%. I'm like, oh, shit. Um, so cr- what so was- such a crazy part about this is you wake up in a bear market with right. crypto. But you we, go, you we go to bed and you wake up and there's a bear market. We've spoken about this a billion times that risk, in, risk is always guaranteed with any asset class. Returns aren't. But especially with stuff like this, like I promise you that I was saying to the advisors, like to position sizes, I promise you, you're going to wake up in a 20% bear market overnight. And I didn't think it was going to happen this, this quickly. I wrote a piece on this of the weekend and you were kind of going back and forth with me. Like this is the this is where wealth management has to like step in and big time like advisors setting the right expectations for this. This is a like 24-7 markets. No advisor has ever dealt with that before. Right? right. Like, it's not like advisors have been trading Forex or right. something. So this is right. this is completely different where a client could say, why am I down 25% on the weekend? It's like, well, that's how crypto works. Right. Um, all right. So what was interesting, again, Bianca coming in with the killer charts. This was the worst one day performance. We're, look, we're, look, we're clocking midnight to midnight, going back to looks like May or June. And what was interesting was that usually in a bear market, Bitcoin performs better than all of the other coins. And we saw the opposite. Like Bitcoin fell more than Ethereum. Uh, a lot of the DeFi stuff got absolutely annihilated. But that was very interesting. You don't see that. So I don't know if this is like, I don't know if uh, if this is something to to be aware of, to, to make anything out of this, or is this just a one-time thing? But this is definitely different than all the previous sell-offs. It is interesting, especially since a lot of times it's the leverage that, that like cascades these sell-offs and turns them into a waterfall. And there's probably more leverage in the other stuff usually. So yeah, that is So anyway, Ben, what's your price target? <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, Shane Mack, uh, we'll link to this in the show notes, wrote a really good post about wallets. And this was the salient point talking about crypto wallets, like MetaMask and that sort of stuff. He said, marketing will change too because of this. Today, marketers go after influencers. Tomorrow, they go after owners they find from wallets. And here's what he means. In Web3, everything is public to discover what address owns what. If I was going to launch a new product and wanted everyone who owned a board ape to know about it, I could airdrop them some tokens or NFTs so they would know about our new product or service. The future of marketing is about making people owners right out of the gate versus trying to get them to like or follow something. Do you think, I read this piece too, you told me to check it out. Do you think that there's a ceiling on the, the wallet stuff unless they make it way easier to use? Because yeah, so Mario I mean, like Gabriel, my, my parents have all their yeah. passwords on their computer on a post-it note, right? Like they're not going to, yes. no, they get never. a wallet and it's gone immediately. Mario Gabrielli did a piece this this weekend about MetaMask, which was excellent. And one of the points that he made was this was built by developers for developers. Right. You've, you have used MetaMask. It is not user-friendly. It's it is not, not intuitive. intuitive at all. <laughs> so Rainbow is way easier. I don't think I could fund that because I'm in New York. I don't know if I'm wrong or not, but I, I couldn't link my credit cards to set that up. Anyway, yeah, no, w- wallets are like uh, definitely not for, for the layperson. But that, that so, idea that of like... Uh, sending products, that's like having your own email newsletter list of emails already and you have it all, like, so you can have targeted marketing, basically. That doesn't make yeah, sense so to me. Hold the price of all of this stuff for a second. Like, all, this is what is so exciting to me. So, over the weekend, I have, I have tickets, I have tickets for the Knicks and the Nuggets. They were playing on Saturday at one o'clock. It's a matinee game, usually a light audience. And so the face value, so the, the the tickets flex in price. So let's say that my floor for like the Wizards, no offense, maybe that's a bad example because they're actually good, but whatever. Let's use the Wizards. The floor price of my tickets are 115 bucks a seat, whatever it is. So for the Lakers, it could go up to like 290, 300. I don't know the exact number. For this particular game, the face price was $220 a, t- a ticket. 
I was with the boys, as I said, Robin was away Thursday, Friday. So I think I listed the tickets on Thursday, forgot about them, panicked on Saturday morning, like, oh shit, I gotta, gotta get rid of these. The 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 step up fees are just hilariously outrageous. Like app yes. like legitimately could be 20, 25%. But here's the thing that really pisses me off. There is a floor to how low you can go on the prices, on the tickets. So my face value was 220. I couldn't list it then below $98. Whoa. On Ticketmaster. This is on Ticketmaster. That was as low as I can go. On StubHub, I needed to upload a PDF. I'm with the boys. I don't have time to upload a PDF. I don't even know how to upload a PDF for my tickets. Anyway, the tickets This is went, the low-hanging fruit, right? Come on. I couldn't sell the tickets. I f***ing had to eat 450 bucks or here's whatever a, it was. Here's a question for you uh, on sports, not on Web3. What age do your boys have to be before you start bringing them to games? Like when are you going to start when are you going to start indoctrinating them to become Knicks fans? Um I don't know. So I think about this because six. So I, I start I started going to games when I was a little boy. I was probably like seven or eight years old. Okay. So I, I started indoctrinating my daughter into Michigan football the last few years and she didn't really care. And then all of a sudden this year, of course, when they're good, she cares. And I don't want to be that obnoxious fan that like brags my team's good. But Michigan, they're in the college football playoffs and like Michigan fans are going crazy because it's been so long. But my seven year old, they played it, they played the Big Ten championship game at eight o'clock. It probably didn't start till like eight fifteen, eight thirty. Our kids are in bed by eight usually. She asked, Hey, can I stay up for the first half? I want to watch the game with you. And she's like into it, watching the football game. And this is like, sports are so dumb in the grand scheme of things when you think about it. Like, God, why do I care so much about this stuff? But like getting that kind of stuff with your, like my daughter wanted to watch the game with me, like asking questions. Like, why is this? It was, it was unbelievable. I have three of my best friends from college that we barely ever see each other anymore because people move to different cities and have families and just, it happens. And sports brings you together. For, for, For probably the last 10 years, during a Michigan football game, the three of us will text each other exclusively about the game. Outside of the game, we never text each other. We don't ask each other about family. <laughs> the only thing we talk is sports. I mean, it's the same thing like with my dad. That like that's our that's our conversation right. thing to keep things. Anyway, it's one of those things. I, where, I, I mean, I'm sure you I have was, this with your your dad and the Knicks and stuff, of right? Of course, and, yeah. of course I do. Of course I do. Um, I was looking through old photos uh, yesterday. My dad brought over a box of old photos, which was incredibly nostalgic to do. And one of the pictures that I happened to pull out was a 15 year old, Michael hair and everything. And I'm sitting at my desk, uh, in my bedroom and I've got like, uh, posters of from slam magazine all over my wall and books. Just I'll throw this picture up. So, so you could see it just scattered everywhere. And one of the things that I have that is very like on brand for me, 20 years later was a VHS tape of, the relic with Tom Sizemore. <laughs> wow, nice! I love that was like the museum. When I was right? fifteen, right? Love that. It was the American Museum of Natural History in Chicago. Okay, interesting. Love that movie. All right, that's a good one. Anyway, uh, oh, this is interesting. I didn't have time to read this. Grayscale did their investor survey, and at first, I'm like, "This is such bullshit." But then I'm like, "Well, I could, I, I might be able to buy this." They said that one in four Americans with over $10,000 in investable assets reported and owning Bitcoin in some form. And now that I say that out loud, there's no way that's true <laughs> because high. the percentage of people that have more than $10,000, I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess uh, half of them are over 50. Oh, that's true. Good point. And so just based on that alone, there's no way that this is true. Yeah. Yeah. Because I lot- would say yeah. that one in four Young investors, I bet probably if you one in, under the age of fifty. Under the age of fifty, I bet one and two. I bet it's like very high. Yeah, that's good. We haven't debunked a good survey in a while. It's it has been a minute. All right, Barons had a piece this weekend that they think the housing boom could last for a decade, and they're talking about housing stocks. But there was a few interesting tip. We talked about this last week a little bit. They basically said so. Construction starts on new single family housing is finally going to top 1 million this year after being like $750,000 a year for the previous 10 years. That's still way below like 1.6 million annual housing starts from 2004 to 2006, which is the bubble. But they're saying to like to actually meet the supply constraints we have with housing in this country, we would need 2 million housing starts a year for a decade to get there. Are you doubling down on your housing prices are too low take? Possibly. Just the the whole thing is it's not even like a demand thing. It's totally a supply thing. I don't think that it's even that demand is like crazy and people are going nuts for houses. I just think there really aren't enough houses. Like housing supply is even more constrained than Bitcoin supply. Right? Uh yeah. 
Yeah. That's that's my whole thesis is that there just aren't enough houses and that the scars from the last bubble, the hangover from that, just wrecked the housing industry, unfortunately. All right. Listener question here. Yeah, let's let's we know we've got time. Let's do a let's bang through a few of these. Okay. All right. Let's take them in order. My good friend and his dad recently made a significant investment to a company that claims to be a quote unique private bank. Oh boy. And offers a guaranteed return on their investment using crypto. And other strategic investments. Oh man, you know what I just did? You know that t- that um, uh, Antonio Banderas gif where he's like, <laughs> uh, he and his dad are now. Oh God, affiliate marketers. Now I'm doing the soccer coach. Red flag, red flag, red flag. <laughs> affiliate marketers for this company, and it pains me to see his family get sucked into an obvious pyramid scheme that will eventually scam them out of money. Do you guys have any advice on how to make them realize they're making a terrible financial decision before it's too late? Yes, I do. There's a little book called Don't Fall For It by an author named Ben Carlson. Speaking of that, we got a hilarious email yesterday. This literally made me laugh out loud. Somebody said to us, uh, here was the, the subject. Is Ben Moonlighting as an NFL kicker? Did you see this? No. <laughs> hey guys, love the show and forgot to send this in last week. By the way, this is a great, another example of sports being, bringing people together. Okay. Hey guys, love the show and forgot to send this in last week after I saw it. This came up on Yahoo Fantasy Football on the page for Greg Zarline after another guy named Carlson went bananas for Las Vegas last week. Gave me a good laugh. Keep up the good work. Uh, somebody, somebody wrote, oh my God, why did I play this turnover Ben Carlson? Loser. <laughs> Oh, then someone said it's really Dan Carlson. Somebody said, same. Why do you have two kickers? And then somebody wrote, it's Dan Carlson. <laughs> Face palm. All right. At least I'm not, yeah, that makes sense. So anyway, it's really difficult to convince. Oh, what's that line? It's, oh, it's easier to scam somebody than to convince them that they've been scammed. I don't think, I think it's basically impossible to peep, to get, if someone who's in it and they, they've been promised that if you just bring in 10 more people and then if they bring in 10 more people, it sounds so uh, like the, oh mark twain yeah the allure, allegedly the, whatever the allure of that is just you, it's I, easier I think, to fool people than to convince them that they've been fooled that's a mark twain yeah. mark twain i don't think that you especially if they're already in it it's not like they're just considering it i don't think that you're going anything you say is there's nothing you do basically this is this is a unfortunately there's there's nothing you can do you could try but it's like you feel powerless it feels like you're watching a slow motion train wreck yeah i don't think that's unfortunately tough, they're tough, tough yeah Tough situation. Uh, Hi, Michael and Ben. I am trying to move to an upgraded home in the next five years. In order to do that, I think I need more than just the equity and hopefully increase value of my current home. Are there any strategies you would suggest outside of just putting money into a savings account to be ready for the purchase? We're still putting these in the doc? I guess. uh, Well, (laughs) in the next five years, I don't even know at this point. At a certain point, I mean, I guess you might have to, if my housing thesis is correct, you may have to change your expectations for what your next house is going to be. Like the the, tr- the trade-up, right? Depending on how much your house goes up in value. Maybe li- listen to the, the episode that we did with, with Life Goals. We spoke all about this. It is, this is an unenviable situation that unfortunately so many people are living with. And Ben seems to think it's not an issue. Next question. <laughs> Last one. Let's do one more. Um, I love your show. And since I heard all about Michael's refi horror story, I figured I'd share mine. Oh, again, check out Doma. Great episode. We bought a house in December 2019 with an adjustable jumbo loan of 3.5%. That was the best deal we could find at the time. A few weeks ago, Credit Karma advertised by Ally, powered by Better.com to me. Oh, did you see that video of the Better.com CEO laying off 15% of the workforce? No. If you're on this call... You are part of the unlucky group being laid off. Your employment here is terminated effective immediately. After filling out a simple appreci- a simple oh, wait, application. So this, this guy laid off 15% over his, over his work f- staff on Zoom? On Zoom. It was cringe. It was really bad. Okay. After filling out a simple application online, the next day they offered us a fixed 30 year at 2.75. They gave us a choice to either take some money out of the property or just refi the existing job alone. We did the latter. The entire process took only three weeks with 99% of it seamlessly done online. On the final day, we had a notary come to our house to sign a few papers, which took only 15 minutes. Not once did I have to explain my credit card bills or what I spent my money on, as Michael unfortunately did. If this isn't a clear sign that fintechs is the future, I don't know what it is. Oh, 
Interesting. So, I thought this was going to go the other way. This was a good. Okay, so this is so a good they're story. saying fintech solved the problem a little bit. We we did that. We did one of ours with Ally too, and they they did send a notary to the house to to take care of it, which made it easy. So I guess this is short year brick and mortar bank basically. Fintech is going to um, save the day. By the way, the best part I thought one of the best parts about our Doma talk was was the fact that you have assumed all these years that blockchain is going to fix title insurance. And he said, no, no, no. Blockchain is not really going to fix it. That's not the problem. Yeah. That that threw me for a loop. When he said that, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs>